afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Audit Hearing and Speech Center Professional Online Seminar 2022. My name is Jolie Wall. It's my pleasure to be your host for today. Lovely to see you all. Today's topic is about hearing technology and cognition. More and more studies have pointed towards the potential correlation between hearing loss and cognitive ability, in which people with hearing loss have a higher chance of developing dementia or other forms of cognitive decline. Good news is that recent empirical findings show that the use of hearing aid can help with the recovery of the brain to a certain extent. In other words, hearing technology could reduce the likelihood of delayed the development of dementia. This year, we are thrilled to have honorable guest speakers, Dr. Alejandro Lopez Verdes and his research collaborators, and also Dr. Elaine Ng on board to talk, talk us through this interesting topic. We will be having a Q&A session followed by each topic. So please feel free to type in any questions or thoughts in the chat box on the right at any time. Our speakers are more than happy to answer them after their presentations. Firstly, we'll have Professor Pierre Stolz, Dr. Irasima Leroy, and Dr. Alejandro Lopez Verdes from Global Brain Health Institute and Sense Cock Project to share with us. Professor Dawes is a professor at the Center of Hearing Research, University of Queensland. And he is also serving at Manchester Center for Audiology and De Deafness, University of Manchester. Dr. Leroy is an associate professor of geriatric psychiatry at the School of Medicine, Trinity College, Dublin. And is also a member of Global Brain Health Institute. Dr. Verdes is currently an assistant professor in neuroengineering and brain health at Institute of Neuroscience, Trinity College, Dublin. His research focuses on applied neuroengineering, supporting aging, sensory dysfunction, and cognition. Also, we we'll also have Dr. Maureen Doty Tomasola, who is the senior international trainer from Oticon Export, as the moderator. Just a kind reminder to everyone, if you have any questions or thoughts, you can uh, please feel free to type in your um, questions on the chat box in the right uh, at, at any time during the seminar. A very well, warm welcome to Professor Dawes, Dr. Leroy and Dr. Verdes. Thank you very much, uh, Yoli, and welcome everyone to this seminar. It, it's really a pleasure to be here. So I would like to thank the organizers for, for their invitation to, to participate in this seminar and be able to convey this message to you. I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Dawes and Professor Irasema as my co-speakers of this uh, very interesting topic. So the, the topic that we have prepared for you today is perspectives on hearing loss and brain health, particularly looking at interactions, interventions, and innovations. So very briefly, just to set the scene before we get on with the main talks, I just wanted to walk you a little bit through it about what do we mean about perspectives on hearing loss and brain health. So thankfully, brain health is, is a very broad term to define, but there is a more and more consensus on, on where we stand. So we can see brain health as a state of brain functioning, particularly a state that spans across multiple domains. And this makes it very, very complex because there's a lot of interactions particularly if we see brain health as being comprised by cognitive function, social and emotional function, motor function, behavior function, and sensory function. So there is brain health across all these domains. It is always very important to see these interactions. All the things to consider is that brain health is present irrespective of disorders. So it's not only uh, that we have brain health in the absence of neurological disorders, brain health is a continuous and we can have brain health at any time. So it's also very important to open our minds into that perspective, into that world. It's a lifelong journey. So it's not something that we have a cross-sectional uh, aspect of it. So we have brain health from the moment we are born until the moment that we die. And this spans across neuroplasticity, pruning, recovery, et cetera, and so on. Optimization of brain health brings positive effects to our life, particularly looking into behavior, motor function, cognitive function, and sensory function. 
So it's always very attractive to look at where we can maximize our brain health throughout life. Now, if you see the different uh, domains across which brain health parts, it can't, I can't help making the, the overlap with hearing loss. So hearing loss, when you think about it, also taps into many of these domains. Sensory, of course, but also behaviorally, cognitive, and social and emotional. So we have a big overlap between these two areas. So it's very important to make the links and make the associations that are required in order to work from one domain to another. So if there is a link between brain, brain health and hearing loss, then we need to build a bridge. So this is, of course, a bridge that you would all be very familiar with. And this is where we try to bring this perspective talk for you today. So where are we building bridges? Where can we build bridges further? So our headline for today is uh, Professor Pierce Doss will give us a, a talk about interactions of hearing loss and cognition, followed by uh, Professor Yasim Laroy, who will talk to us about the role of sensory support to improve outcomes for people with dementia. And you'll have me back here for a little review of hearing aid technology and innovations to impact brain health. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Pierce Doss to give us his talk about interactions of hearing loss and cognition. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Um, can you see the slides okay? And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you. So I thought I'd begin with some uh, background, why uh, dementia is such a global priority. So uh, these are some figures that show uh, a huge increase in the numbers of people living with dementia in China and the Western Pacific region that were estimated by this uh, 2006 paper. And this is mostly because people are living longer, there's more older people, but then there's more age associated uh, conditions such as dementia, which represent a huge challenge and uh, not just a financial burden, but a huge personal cost in terms of the impacts of dementia. So there are two global priorities then. First of all, to identify treatments for or strategies that can prevent or delay the onset of dementia and try and reduce the numbers of people in with dementia. And secondly, to identify, identify ways of improving quality of life for those people that are living with dementia. And in this uh, talk and the, and the uh, uh, subsequent presentations, I think there are opportunities for us to uh, uh, address both of these priorities by uh, treating hearing impairment. So you might have seen this uh, a review come out uh, a, a couple of years ago. The Lancet Journal uh, uh, convened a special commission to look at potentially uh, modifiable risk factors for development of uh, dementia. If you could address some of these modifiable risks, you could reduce the numbers of people living with dementia. And this review identified a number of things you might expect, such as uh, smoking, uh, chronic disease, um, uh, diabetes, that sort of thing. But interesting, I identified hearing loss as one of the uh, uh, top uh, uh, preventable, potentially preventable risk factors for dementia in later life. Now, uh, I should say these, these risk estimates are based on uh, estimates for the uh, level of exposure to these risk factors that uh, is for the UK and similar countries, uh, and that does not necessarily apply to other countries. So, for example, uh, in, in the UK has quite high numbers of people that smoke, but in China, that number, about two and a half times as many people proportionally smoke as they do in the UK. So probably smoking is a much more important preventable risk factor in China than it is for the UK. But having said that, regardless of the relative importance of these risk factors, hearing loss seems to be a significant marker of risk. 
So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the potential reasons for this uh, link between hearing loss and cognitive outcomes. Uh, and then I'm going to hint at what uh, the possible benefits uh, uh, for cognition might be about addressing hearing loss. And then my, my colleagues will elaborate on that in, these, uh, in their two talks. So I guess the first thing to, to say is that Lancet report that linked hearing loss, uh, identified hearing loss as a risk factor for later life dementia, That's that conclusion is just based on observational data, such as this, uh, this study. This is one of the three studies that the uh, Lancet Review used. And in this study, they uh, tracked people over 11 years or so and related their risk of developing dementia over that time to the baseline levels of hearing loss. And they found the more severe your hearing loss at baseline, the more likely you were to develop dementia over that time period. But the problem with those studies is that they're observational. So they, they could conclude that hearing loss is a marker of risk for developing later life dementia, but they couldn't say if that represents a causal relationship or not. So, uh, for example, I have a young young son, and uh, you know, I've observed that his shoe size has increased as he's he's got older, and so is the size of his vocabulary. But there's no direct causal link before, between those those two things. So, if I bought him some big shoes, it would have no impact on the size of his vocabulary. So, it's the same sort of issue with interpreting this link between hearing loss and dementia risk. So, one possibility is that hearing loss does have some sort of direct impact on cognition that increases people's risk of dementia. But it could be that the association is actually the other way around. So what we're seeing is some sort of cognitive impact on, on hearing. Or it could be that there's no direct link between hearing loss and cognition at all. But the reason why they're associated is because there are common causes that impact on both things. So I'm going to start with this third possibility first, and this is probably true because there are a range of uh, risk factors. In fact, all of the risk factors that the Lancet Review identified as increasing risk of dementia, they're also risk factors for hearing loss. So it's probably the case that there are common causes such as smoking or diabetes or uh, uh, excessive alcohol consumption that increase your risk both of hearing loss and of cognitive decline and dementia. Secondly, uh, it's possible that there is this cognitive impact on hearing. So the reason why we see this association is because cognitive factors are impacting on people's hearing performance. And uh, to illustrate what I mean, here's a diagram of what uh, hearing in the broader sense, listening involves. So this bottom section here is the bit that audiologists usually concern themselves with, that sort of detection of an auditory signal. But then that signal uh, gets conveyed sort of higher up the listening pathway. And this is where all those cognitive components come into, into play. So you have to be able to focus your attention on the relevant parts of the signal. You have to uh, comprehend the signal. Uh, you have to relate that signal to information that you're stored in memory and react to that signal. So somebody could report listening difficulties, not because they have a problem with uh, the bottom part of the, this pathway, but because they have a cognitive problem that is impacting on their on their hearing, on their listening. Uh, we know that cognitive factors also impact people's performance on uh, audiometry and other sorts of tests that we use to assess hearing. So, you know, part of this association between hearing loss and cognition could be because cognitive factors are impacting on hearing and listening. But I guess the intriguing possibility is that hearing loss does have some kind of direct impact on cognition. And this might offer the opportunity then to prevent dementia and improve cognitive outcomes by treating hearing loss with hearing aids, for example, and other hearing interventions. So there are various ways that people have hypothesized hearing loss might impact on, on, on cognition. Uh, and here are some of these hypotheses. First of all, that the hearing loss causes some sort of listening effort, which comes with a cognitive cost. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail shortly. Uh, secondly, that this 
chronic state of listening effort induces some sort of permanent adverse uh, brain changes that impact cognition. Uh, thirdly, maybe there's some sort of direct impact of auditory deprivation on brain structures. Or finally, possibly the impact of hearing loss on cognition is via some uh, indirect impact. So hearing loss leading to uh, social isolation or depression or uh, reduced physical activity, for example. And then that impacts on people's cognition and increases their risk of dementia. Uh, but the thing I'm going to focus on in the uh, rest of my talk is this possibility that uh, hearing loss impacts cognition via listening effort. I think probably there's evidence for all of these things to some extent. So how does this uh, listening effort work? So here's a visual illustration. Uh, this is the situation if you have good peripheral hearing, the signal is nice and clear, you can hear what's, uh, what's being said quite easily, uh, what a piece of work is man, how noble in reason. Uh, but if you have a peripheral hearing impairment, you can still hear some of the signal and you can get the gist of what's being said, but you might need to work harder cognitively to fill in the gaps and get the gist of what's being said. Uh, but that's okay, it lets you get the, get the message of what's being talked about, but that comes with a cognitive cost. So I'm going to try and illustrate that in a little short example for you. I'm going to play you a series of seven words, and I'd like you to try and remember each word after you've heard it. So here we go, if you'd like to just listen to the sequence of words and try and remember the sequence. Orange. C. Auto. Station. Horse. Captain. Singer. Hey, do you remember what those those words were. <laughs> Alejandro looks it looks un uncertain. <laughs> so here is the list of words. Um, so that shouldn't have been too too difficult. Um, uh, average people's sort of uh, memory span is around uh, seven items. Um, now I'm going to play another set of uh, seven words, but this time they'll be played in background noise. So uh, have a listen to this set. Hey, do you remember those seven words? Uh, here they were. So uh, th th in the noise, they've presented at a pretty favorable signal to noise ratio. So you should have been able to identify most of those words. Um, but interestingly enough, people have demonstrated experimentally that there is a cognitive cost of listening to words in where the signal is a little bit degraded, even though they might be able to recognize those words. So, for example, in this sort of classic 1966 uh, experiment, uh, this researcher Patrick Rabbit uh, presented lists of words to uh, young, uh, young people. I think they might have been young uh, soldiers, military conscripts. Uh, they had them repeat each word so 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 they knew that they'd heard the word correctly uh, and then they had them try and recognize these print 20 words uh, in a in a set of 100 words and they had them do this task in quiet and noise and uh, Pat Rabbit found that people had poorer recall for the words that had been presented in noise even though they'd they'd heard all those words and been able to identify them correctly so he concluded that this uh, effort of listening and background noise to slightly degraded stimuli had impacted people's encoding of these words in their in their working memory such that they won't be able to uh, recall them as well. And uh, Pat Rabbit subsequently demonstrated that this happens also for people with hearing loss. And he there's this nice quote from this 1991 paper saying that 
A wide range of other behavioral difficulties in the elderly might be misattributed to central changes in, in cognition, when actually they're the consequence of mild and easily remediable peripheral sensory changes. Uh, so, that, you know, people might think somebody has a cognitive problem when actually they just have a hearing loss that's impacting on their cognitive performance because of listening effort. So uh, I guess there are various ways of assessing listening effort, but uh, an easy way to do it is just ask people questions about how effortful they find listening. Uh, so for example, do you have to put in a lot of effort to follow the conversation in a noisy environment? And if you ask this, these questions to people with hearing loss, you, you find that they report much higher, people with hearing loss of, of different sorts, they report much higher levels of listening effort and associated le le uh, levels of listening fatigue than uh, people matched for age uh, with normal hearing. So I think the consequence for this then, for cognition, is, is this. So imagine then that this is a decline in people's functional performance due to age-related declines in cognition. And when they reach this point of functional impairment, such that they can no longer really cope in daily life, uh, they might be diagnosed with dementia. But imagine then that that person has an untreated hearing impairment and there is a cost of listening effort. If this person is always having to do the sort of effortful listening that comes with a cognitive cost, there's uh, effectively reduces their functional performance in daily life such that you know they might reach the threshold of dementia earlier, they might look as though they're uh, much more, more cognitively impaired than they really are, just because of the impacts of hearing impairment. But the, the intriguing prospect though, and the opportunity is that if we could treat this uh, easily remediable peripheral sensory impairment by providing a hearing aid, for example, you could improve somebody's function in daily life, uh, you could delay the point at which they might meet a diagnosis of, of dementia. So to summarize my talk so far, I think uh, probably there are common causes that uh, increase risk both of hearing loss and cognition, but that's important because it means hearing loss then is a marker of brain health and people who have unhealthy lifestyles, who you know, smoke or don't, don't have a good diet, they're at re increased risk of both hearing loss and cognitive decline and dementia, and they'd probably benefit from healthy lifestyle interventions. Uh, also, cognition affects hearing, uh, um, and, uh, including listening in a variety of daily listening situations. Uh, but hearing impairment also probably impacts on cognition, perhaps by increasing uh, listening effort or some other, uh, some other pathway. But I think there's an important opportunity then to improve cognitive outcomes by addressing hearing impairment. And uh, before I hand over to my colleagues who are gonna tell you more about that, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much and please feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Dawes. Um, I just have a question. I don't see any questions yet from the audience, but um, one thing that I, I noted in the quote from Dr. Rabbit from the later quote was that, you know, um, these difficulties with hearing that cause, um, you know, cognitive effort can be easily remediable, you know, hearing problems and noise, but that's not quite so true, is it? If only well, for- well, well, in terms of uh, uh, hearing aids and- uh, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, I guess hearing aids are, are hugely helpful, but uh, they don't restore normal hearing. And especially in noisy situations, uh, people find that uh, they may have a limited benefit from from hearing aids. But the, as you would know, there are technologies uh, that try and deal with that situation, you know, noise in, uh, reduction and directional microphones and things like that. Uh, and there is also potential for uh, people's cognitive performance, their listening effort to be indexed by their hearing aid so that the hearing aid can adapt the signal processing to try and optimize uh, the, the pe person's listening experience and reduce listening effort. And I think the subsequent speakers, Alejandro and Elaine, are going to talk about those possibilities. That's a really excellent point about that we can actually now measure listening effort using pupillometry to see 
um, if the technology can really make a, add an extra benefit for the patient. So thank you for mentioning that. Elaine has a question. Um, you said you mentioned there are different hypotheses how hearing impairment may affect cognition. So what is the current focus in research looking at these three different hypotheses of which one causes which? Oh, that's a good question, Elaine. Yeah, so um, I, I think probably quite a popular hypothesis is that hearing loss leads to sort of social isolation. Uh, and that seems quite a plausible pathway that hearing loss might have adverse impacts on depression. So, so I think there is quite a lot of research interest around uh, the benefits of hearing intervention and reducing social isolation and sort of psychosocial benefits with secondary impacts on, on cognition. Um, but I think also people think that there might be some sort of direct impact of hearing loss on brain structures uh, that support cognition, because in a lot of epidemiological modeling studies, uh, people treat these possible causal mediators as confounds, and they enter them into the, uh, the, the, the model, and then they look at the sort of residual association with hearing loss and cognition, and say, well, that, that's probably a direct impact of hearing loss and cognition. But, um, but it seems to me that there should be more attention to other potential uh, mediators um, but yeah, I, I think possibly, uh, so that social isolation one is, is quite a plausible mediator, I think. Uh, but I think also, I think the, the sort of functional benefit of improving hearing and the impact on listening effort is, is probably, a, in my view, one of the most plausible uh, uh, impacts of, of hearing and cognition and opportunities to improve outcomes by, with hearing aids, for example. Thank you, thank you very much. 